going to discuss the arteriosclerosis and then the atherosclerosis. Arteriosclerosis is the narrowing and hardening of the arteries where it occurs with aging or during aging as degenerative changes. So in arteriosclerosis, there is um, loss of elasticity of the blood vessel and thickening of the artery, artery walls that progresses to hardening as the calcium deposits and it forms to reduce the diameter of the vessel and cause the slowing of blood flow. While atherosclerosis is the specific kind of arteriosclerosis, Atherosclerosis is the buildup of fat, cholesterol, and other substances that form into plaque and form into plaque in the inner lining or the intima of the arterial wall. The plaque can burst that leads to a blood clot and cause the arteries to narrow and blocking the blood flow. So this too leads to a decreased blood flow to other parts of the body. So in assessment of arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis, first is assess the blood pressure in both arms since there is a high incidence of hypertension in patients with atherosclerosis. Next is palpate the pulses at all the major sites of the body and note any differences. And palpate each carotid artery separately to prevent blocking blood flow to the brain. Next is feel for temperature differences in the lower extremities because an extremity in a person with a severe atherosclerotic disease may be cool or cold with the diminished or absent pulse since there is a narrowing of the artery and there is um, decreased blood flow. Next is check for capillary feeling. Prolonged capillary feeling like more than 3 seconds indicate poor circulation. And then next is ascultate for birth sound in the larger arteries such as carotid, aortic, femoral, and popliteal arteries. A brute is a turbulent swishing sound which can be soft or loud in pitch. It is usually heard as a result of blood trying to pass through a narrowed artery. Next is assess for the following manifestations. So the manifestations for a person with atherosclerosis in the coronary arteries are chest pain, shortness of breath, and arrhythmia. And manifestations for a person with atherosclerosis in the internal carotid and middle cerebral are numbness or weakness in arms or legs, Difficulty speaking or slurred speech, temporary loss of vision in one eye, confusion, severe headache, and drooping muscle in the face. Next manifestation for a person with atherosclerosis in the popliteal artery is leg pain when walking or claudication or decreased blood pressure in an affected limb. And then manifestations for a person with atherosclerosis in the renal arteries are high blood pressure and swelling of hands and feet. While in laboratory assessment, a person with arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis, there is elevated lipids including cholesterol and triglycerides, um, where there is increased low-density lipoprotein cholesterol and there is low-high-density lipoprotein cholesterol. Now let's move on to the pathophysiology. The predisposing factors are the following. Family history of cardiovascular disease, age like older adult, race, and gender. The precipitating factors are the following. Low HDLC, high LDLC, increased triglycerides, diabetes mellitus, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, smoking, stress, and hypertension. Actually, the causes of the arteriosclerosis or the atherosclerosis is unknown, but the development of the atherosclerosis involves an inflammatory response, which begins with injury to the vascular endothelium. So, the presence of inflammation causes attraction of inflammatory cells such as monocytes that turns into macrophage, macrophages and then the macrophages ingest lipids becoming foam cells that transport the lipids into the arterial wall. And then the activated macrophages release biochemical substances that can further damage the endothelium. Where the smooth muscle cells within the vessel wall proliferate and form a fibrous cup over a core filled with fatty streaks of lipids combined with cells, fibrin, and cell debris to form plaques and are deposited in the inner wall or inner lining of the arterial wall and inflammatory infiltrate. So a plaque may be stable or unstable depending on the degree of inflammation and thickness of the fibrous cup. So if the fibrous cup of the plaque is thick and the lipid pool remains stable and it can resist the stress of blood flow and vessel movement. But if the cup is thin and inflammation is ongoing, 
the lesion becomes what is called vulnerable plaque because at this point, the lipid core may grow, causing a rupture and hemorrhage into the plaque. And then after the rupture occurs, the exposed underlying tissues causes platelet adhesion and rapid thrombus formation. So at this point, the thrombus may block a blood vessel. So over time, the plaque begins to calcify, causing rigidity of the blood vessel wall. Further narrowing of the arteries causes inadequate perfusion and oxygenation to distal tissues, resulting in ischemia and infarction of the arteries. Arteries such as coronary arteries, internal carotid and middle cerebral, popliteal artery, and renal arteries. So when there is inadequate perfusion and oxygenation to the arteries, um, signs and symptoms could occur. Depend on It depends on the arteries being affected. And then when the vessels delivering blood to the extremities, heart, kidney, and brain narrow because of plaque formation, serious consequences or um, complications can result. Such as coronary artery disease like heart attack, carotid artery disease like stroke, peripheral artery disease, and chronic kidney disease like kidney failure. So here in the illustration, this is the progression of the atherosclerosis. So here is the artery, and as you can see, there's a plaque form in the lining of the artery where the plaque grows in the artery or in the damaged artery and then the plaque ruptures causing blood clot and limiting blood flow. So that's all for the assessment and pathophysiology of the arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. Good day, now I will be discussing the diagnostic and laboratory tests for arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. So here we have the blood test, which will compose of the total cholesterol, the high-density lipoprotein, low-density lipoprotein, triglycerides, C-reactive protein, and the homocysteine. We also have electrocardiogram, stress test, the echocardiogram, computed tomography scan, Doppler ultrasound, ankle brachial index, and the cardiac catheterization and angiogram. So for the blood test, this is necessary to test the blood sugar and cholesterol levels since high levels of such increases the risk of atherosclerosis. So here, as mentioned earlier, the total cholesterol, high-density lipoprotein, low-density lipoprotein, triglycerides, C-reactive protein, and homocysteine. So metabolic syndrome is also a major risk factor of cardiovascular disease. And these are the conditions that would indicate the diagnosis of such syndrome. So here we have the insulin resistance, which is a fasting plasma glucose greater than 100 mg per deciliter, or an abnormal glucose tolerance test. We also have central obesity, which is a waist circumference of greater than 35 inches in females and 40, greater than 40 inches in males. We have dyslipidemia, which is triglycerides greater than 150 mg per deciliter, high-density lipoprotein of the, uh, less than... 50 mg per deciliter in females and less than 40 mg deciliter in males. For the blood pressure, it is persistently greater than 130 over 85 mm mercury. Uh, the pro-inflammatory state, which is high levels of C-reactive protein, and the prothrombic state, which is high fibrinogen level. So how do those mentioned earlier contribute to the development of atherosclerosis or arteriosclerosis. So for the low-density lipoprotein, uh, when there is an increased number of this, the LDL particles will adhere to the receptors in the arterial endothelium where macrophages will ingest them and will contribute in plaque formation. For the C-reactive protein, this is a protein that is linked to inflammation of the arteries which will compromise blood flow. And for the homocysteine, this is an amino acid that is linked to the development of atherosclerosis because it can damage the endothelial lining of arteries and promote thrombus formation. For the patient preparation of this, we should instruct the patient to fast 6 to 12 hours before specimen collection if lipoprotein fractionation or triglyceride measurements are ordered and recommend fasting if cholesterol levels alone are measured for screening. We will also instruct the patient to avoid excessive exercise for at least 12 hours and to refrain from alcohol consumption 
for 24 hours before lipoprotein fractionation testing. Now we will proceed to the electrocardiogram. So this is a procedure which evaluates the electrical impulses in the heart and assists in the diagnosis of cardiac dysrhythmias, blocks, damage, infection, or enlargement. So the electrical patterns would suggest whether coronary artery disease is likely and it will detect previous or current attack. So disposable electrodes are placed in standard positions on the skin of the chest wall and extremities to obtain ECG. A variety of electrode combinations called bleeds would obtain several different recordings. So for the patient preparation, there are no food, fluid, activity, or medication restrictions unless by medical direction. Now we will proceed to the stress test. It will show abnormalities in cardiac function as the body experiences increased workload. So this test will either be exercise stress test or a pharmacologic stress test. A pharmacologic stress test is done when the patient is unable to perform the exercise stress test. So for the exercise stress test, um, the patient is either put on a treadmill or a stationary bike. So for this, in response to metabolic demands, our coronary arteries dilate four times its usual diameter. But with the presence of atherosclerosis, it will dilate less and the arteries will be narrowed down by plaque, which will compromise blood flow to the myocardium and thus causing ischemia. For the pharmacologic testing, it will be using vasodilating agents such as adenosine. For the patient preparation, we will instruct the patient to fast, restrict fluids, especially those containing caffeine, and abstain from using tobacco four to six hours before the procedure. We will also instruct to withhold medications 24 hours before the test as ordered by the healthcare provider. We would also instruct the patient to wear comfortable clothes and shoes for the exercise stress test. Now for the echocardiogram, uh, this test uses sound waves to assess the heart. It will identify areas of poor blood flow, heart muscles that aren't contracting normally, and previously injured heart muscles caused by poor blood flow. So this procedure is usually done with stress testing. For the patient preparation, there is no food, fluid, activity, or medication restrictions unless by medical direction. Now we will proceed to the computed tomography scan. The CT scan allows for visualization and assessment of internal organs or structures. This procedure will show hardening and narrowing of large arteries. For the patient preparation, we will instruct the patient to fast and restrict fluids as ordered for 2-4 to four hours before the procedure. This is done as a precaution against aspiration from possible nausea and vomiting. We would also instruct the patient to avoid taking natural products and medications with known anticoagulants, antiplatelet, or thrombolytic properties, or to reduce dosage as ordered before the procedure in case of bleeding. Now, we will proceed to the Doppler ultrasound. This will visualize and assess the blood flow through the blood vessels to evaluate disorders such as risk for stroke related to atherosclerosis. This will determine the degree of the blockage and the speed of blood flow in the arteries. For the patient preparation, some protocols require the patient to avoid nicotine and caffeine for 1-2 to two hours before the procedure to avoid vasoconstriction or vasodilation. No food or medication restrictions unless by medical direction. We will also ensure that interfering studies are performed at least 24 hours before the procedure or can be rescheduled after this procedure. So these interfering studies would include surgery, biopsy, colonoscopy, barium studies, and others. Now we will proceed to the ankle brachial index. So here in the photo, we can see that it is performed with a Doppler ultrasound. So this procedure is done by taking blood pressure from the arms and legs, and then they will be compared to detect peripheral arterial disease, which is usually caused by atherosclerosis. Then we will proceed to cardiac catheterization and angiogram. This will show if the coronary arteries are narrowed or blocked. So we can see in the photo that there is a catheter and it will contain a dye that will fill the arteries and will allow us to visualize the arteries in the x-ray and it will reveal areas of blockage. 
For the patient preparation, we will instruct the patient to fast and restrict fluids as ordered as a precaution against aspiration from possible nausea and vomiting. There is no activity restrictions unless by medical direction. We will also instruct the patient to avoid taking natural products and medications with known anticoagulants since uh, there is a risk of bleeding. So patients on beta blockers before the surgical procedure should be instructed to take their medication as ordered during the perioperative period. And that would be all for the diagnostics and laboratory tests for arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. Thank you. Good day, my name is Jandy Verloba. My task here is to present the different management for arteriosclerosis and atherosclerosis. We'll start off with the medical management, which includes the surgical intervention and radiologic interventions. Now, surgical intervention, uh, vascular surgical procedures are divided into two groups. These are inflow procedures, which improve blood supply from the aorta into the femoral artery and outflow procedures, which provide blood supply to vessels below the femoral artery. Inflow surgical procedures are described with the diseases of the aorta and outflow procedures with peripheral arterial occlusive diseases. For radiologic interventions, we have several interventional radiologic techniques that are important adjunctive therapies to surgical procedures. If an isolated lesion or lesions are identified during the arteriogram, angioplasty, also called percutaneous transluminal angioplasty, or PTA, or an atherectomy may be performed. In coronary atherosclerosis, a minimally invasive procedure called percutaneous transluminal coronary angioplasty, or PTCA, is indicated. In a cardiac catheterization laboratory, a catheter with a balloon tip is inserted usually via the femoral artery and advanced into the heart. Once the blocked coronary artery is entered, the balloon on the catheter is inflated and the atherosclerotic plaque is compressed. For coronary artery stents, um, it is used to prevent closure of coronary artery from an atherosclerotic lesions. Stents are put into place or in place during an angioplasty. A stent is an expandable metal mesh tube that is implanted at the site of blockage in the coronary artery. A stent provides support to a coronary artery wall at the area of stenosis to keep blood flowing through the artery. For atherectomy, um, atherectomy reduces the plaque buildup within the artery using a cutting device or laser. To decrease the risk of reocclusion, stents or small mess tubes made of methanol, titanium, or stainless steel may be inserted to support the walls of blood vessels and prevent collapse immediately after balloon inflation. Moving on to the nutritional management, and an adherence to a low-fat diet is recommended by health, primary health care providers because plaque formation within the arterial vessels is primarily caused by fatty deposits. The patient should be taught about the fat contents present of various foods in collaboration with a nutritionist dietitian. The following are the recommended nutritional interventions. So the first one is uh, the patient should be uh, educated to consume a dietary pattern that emphasizes intake of vegetables, fruits, and whole grains. Second, instruct patients about increasing dietary fiber to 30 grams each day. The patient should also uh, know to consume low-fat dairy products, poultry, fish, legumes, non-tropical vegetable oils, and nuts. And it is also recommended to limit intake of sweets, sugar-sweetened beverages, and red meats. Meats are 
Meats and eggs contain mostly saturated fats and are high in cholesterol. Uh, the aim for a dietary pattern that includes 5% to 6% of calories from saturated fat should be met. And lastly, it is recommended to reduce percent of calories from trans fat. At this point, I will be discussing about the pharmacologic management. Now, healthcare providers prescri prescribe a lipid lowering agent for patients with elevated total and LDL levels that do not respond adequately to, to dietary and nutritional intervention. The serum cholesterol level, the degree to which the level needs to be decreased, and the patient's age are the factors that contribute to the drug of choice and dosing, a class of drugs known as HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors or known as statins successfully reduces total cholesterol in most patients when used for an extended period of time. Examples of these drugs include atorvastatin with a brand name Lipitor, Luvastatin or Mevacor, Simvastatin Zocor, and Pitavastatin Livalo which lower both LDL and triglyceride levels. Another low lipid lowering agent include nicotinic acid or niacin with a brand name niaspan. A B vitamin may lower LDL and very low density lipoprotein or VLDL cholesterol levels and increase HDL levels in some patients. It is used as a single agent or in combination with acid binding resin drug or estatin. For the nursing management, we have nursing interventions, which involves modification of risk factors, creation of exercise program to improve circulation and functioning capacity, adherence to medication therapy, management of hypertension and diabetes, improving peripheral arterial circulation, promoting vasodilation, and preventing vascular compression. So the first nursing intervention would be um, it is recommended that adults engage in aerobic physical activity three or four times a week. Each session should last for 40 minutes on average and involve moderate to vigorous physical activity. It is known or increased activity is known to raise HDL levels and facil facilitate weight loss. Exercise also leads to the development of collateral circulation over time, which permits blood flow around occluded sites. Second intervention would be smoking cessation. Um, smoking cessation is important because smoking contributes to a loss of HDLs. The rate of progressive damage to blood vessels is increased with smoking. The nurse should ensure that the patient is adherent to his, his or her lipid lowering medications. Next, uh, nurses should ensure that hypertension are managed because long-standing elevated blood pressure may result in increased stiffness of vessel walls leading to vessel injury and resulting inflammatory res response within the intima. Inflammatory mediators then lead to the release of growth promoting factors that cause vessels vessel hypertrophy and hyperresponsiveness these changes result in acceleration and aggravation of atherosclerosis also um, hyperglycemia fosters dyslipidemia increased platelet aggregation and altered red blood cell function which can lead to thrombus formation. These metabolic alterations may impair endothelial cell dependent vasodilation and smooth muscle function promoting the development of atherosclerosis. The treatment with insulin, metformin or glu glucophage and other therapeutic interventions that lower plasma glucose levels can lead to improved endothelial function and patient outcomes. Uh, another intervention would be 
elevating the head of the patient's bed using a reclining chair or sitting with the feet resting on the floor because this improves the arterial blood supply for the lower extremities. The nurse can also assist the patient with the walking or other moderate or graded isometric exercises that may be prescribed to promote blood flow and encourage the development of collateral circulation. Next, the nurse can also use application of warmth to promote arterial flow and instruct the patient to avoid cold, cold temperatures because it causes vasoconstriction. The nurse should also ensure adequate clothing and warm temperatures to protect the patient from chilling. Also, warm bath or drink is also helpful in if chilling occurs. A hot water bottle or heating pad may be applied to the patient's abdomen, causing vasodilation throughout the lower extremities. Also, part of the nursing intervention would be uh, to minimize emotional stress to some degree by avoiding stressful situations when possible or by following a stress management protocol or program because emotional upsets stimulate the sympathetic nervous system resulting in peripheral vasoconstriction. Uh, next would be constrictive clothing, clothing and accessories such as tight socks or shoelaces should be avoided because it may impede circulation to the extremities and promote venous stasis. The nurse should also discourage the crossing of the legs for more than 15 minutes at a time because it compresses vessels in the legs. And lastly, analgesics may be helpful in reducing pain so so that the patient can participate in therapies that can increase circulation and ultimately relieve pain more effectively.